Good morning, everyone. With respect for everyone's time, I'm going to get us started today. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar. My name is Carl Hedlund. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm an outreach specialist for the organization Move Minneapolis. I'll be your facilitator today, getting us through a great conversation with our panel of experts from Metro Transit. <laughs> Uh, starting off with a couple of logistics, what you can expect to engage with today. Uh, a heads up that this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube after the fact, and you'll also receive it in an email, um, whether you're joining us here today or whether you are uh, registered to uh, watch the video later, along with an overview and blog post of this, of the highlights after the fact. The closed captioning function is available and activated through Zoom with English as a language available to do that. And uh, we'll have a large portion of the time today available for questions and answers and conversations with our guests. Uh, so please use the Q&A function through the chat as well. At the end of this webinar, there'll be a short uh, survey that should automatically pop up on your screen. And we'd love your feedback to better improve our services and figure out what topics you're excited to learn more about as well. As I mentioned, we're in just a brief introduction for today's agenda, and shortly I'll be handing it over to Metro Transit's leadership that you'll be able to uh, hear from the experts about all the new layers of presence and what is being done on board. And then finally, we'll wrap up with an, uh, an ample amount of time with audience Q&A uh, at the end where you'll be able to uh, engage. Please feel free to answer or drop questions in the Q&A throughout our time today, but we'll be answering them at the end of the session. Starting things off, I mentioned I represent Move Minneapolis. We're a, a federally funded nonprofit that works in downtown Minneapolis to help empower individuals to choose sustainable transportation options. We're not here to change your mind. We're here to help you figure out how you can find joy in your commutes, whether you're uh, uh, commuting to downtown for the first time, you're a daily train rider, or you're taking a trip to the grocery store. Uh, it can often feel like driving alone is the default option. We're here to help you figure out some of those barriers and navigate taking other, uh, taking other options for the first time. What we do, we work with employers and property services. So we help uh, organizations like employers or uh, property managers for downtown residents uh, provide the best resources for their employees or residents. We work with commuters uh, directly, as well as we uh, provide sustainable transportation promotion like we are today. I like to think of us as the liaison between transportation providers like Metro Transit and commuters themselves. One of those services I mentioned specifically is customized consultations. We launched this at, after our last uh, webinar, if you were able to join us. It's something we've always done, but this is a great opportunity if you have follow-up questions or you want to try one of these uh, options of getting around for the first time. We have time slots available with one of my coworkers on Friday afternoons where you can schedule a 15 minute time slot for a direct consultation door to door, trying to figure out your questions or, or take, uh, how, how we can at best help you. Please feel free to take that on if you have any specific questions that aren't answered today. Uh, we're gonna do a really a deep dive on some of the onboard presence for Metro Transit today. We're not gonna be able to cover everything. If you're a first time transit rider, it can often be overwhelming. Um, so we have a depth of resources from everything from trip planning to figuring out uh, commuting in a hybrid world, for example, some of our most recent webinars like this today, where if you want to learn more, please start there. Uh, furthermore, we uh, provide some great uh, resources for uh, getting around, whether that be transit, which uh, you're hearing me say a lot today, or whether that be carpooling or uh, biking, walking, rolling, a lot of great options uh, now that we've got spring around the corner. Uh, specifically, I want to point to our monthly newsletter, which you can expect an April edition for right around the corner. And lastly, like I said, we do a lot of work outside of just transit. 
For example, we've got an exciting event coming up in May in partnership with Henneman County and the city of Minneapolis putting on a celebration of Bike Week. Bike Month is the whole month of May, and we've got a great celebration the morning of May 16th. Here's the save the date, and you can expect a lot more information on that right around the corner. With that all being said, I'm going to get out of the way and hand it off to our experts today. Leslie, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Carl. And if you want to go ahead and bring up our slides, I'll start off with a couple introductions. My name is Leslie Kinderis, and I am the general manager at Metro Transit. I've worked at Metro Transit since 2019 and am still fairly new in the general manager role. I became general manager in July. And if you go to the next slide, I'll introduce the other two people who are joining me today. We have Leah Palmer, who's our Interim Transit Rider Investment Program, or TRIP, Program Manager, and Selena Martina, who's our Senior Manager of Equity and Inclusion, and also leads our Transit Service Intervention Project. So I uh, just wanted to start off by saying thank you to Move Minneapolis for having us today. This is a topic, onboard presence is something we're really prioritizing and just looking forward to sharing some information and answering questions you have. So many of you know, we're the largest public transit provider in the Twin Cities region. We deliver service through bus, light rail, commuter rail. In 2023, we provided around 44 million rides and ridership's increasing. Uh, when we look at 2023 compared to 2022, ridership was up about 16%, and we continue to see ridership growth in the first months of 2024. At the same time, uh, we're seeing a decrease in reported crime on our system. Uh, when we compare the first quarter of 2023 to the last quarter, uh, crime uh, was down about 25%. Now, it was still higher than the year before, uh, but our Police Department and the onboard presence we'll be talking about today seems to be contributing uh, to really addressing many of the issues that uh, riders are concerned about, which includes criminal activity. Uh, we are expanding service, and I believe this is contributing to that increase in ridership. Uh, in 2023, we were able to uh, bring back additional bus service as bus operator hiring improved. We were also able to restore some North Star service uh, as our funding situation around rail changed. Uh, and as we move forward through this year, we're continuing our Network Now project. We won't focus on that project today, but for those of you who are interested, uh, later this year, there will be public involvement opportunity. And this is really our opportunity and to uh, talk to people about how their transportation needs have changed over the last few years and how that can help us prioritize where we bring additional service as operator resources allow. Also looking ahead to next year, we're excited to uh, open up three bus rapid transit lines, our gold line, B line and E line. So more will be coming on that. And the final point here, and I touched on this already, but we are hiring. We are hiring operators, uh, maintenance technicians, facilities cleaners, police officers, many positions. So certainly if uh, you or anyone you know is interested in transit, we have all sorts of roles here. And, and fundamentally, transit is driven by people. And so to continue to expanding on the work we're going to talk about today and some of these other efforts, uh, we, we need more people to join us. So have to get that plug in. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So today the topic is onboard presence. And this is part of our broader efforts to improve safety and the perception of safety on our system. So from our perspective, everyone who is on our system, whether it's a rider, employee, should have a safe, comfortable experience. And part of how uh, we've really charted out our work and our strategy around that is through a project uh, called the Safety and Security Action Plan. Uh, the Safety and Security Action Plan is all actually a culmination of a few years of work. Um, back in June 2020, uh, shortly after the murder of George Floyd, the chair of the Metropolitan Council called on the council to do a review of the Metro Transit Police Department. And that started off with several months of deep community engagement 
that then led to the formation of Metropolitan Council, creating a work group of council members that developed recommendations and a vision around public safety on transit. And part of what we heard from that community engagement is the feeling of public safety on transit is much broader than police. So what started off as a police review actually became a much more comprehensive uh, body of work that addresses police presence for sure, but also has led us to create the additional layers of presence we'll be talking about today, as well as addressing other aspects of our system. For example, we hear from people that the conditions of our facilities, whether they're well lighted, whether they're kept in good repair and clean, that also contributes to a sense of safety. Uh, so there's, there we go. Let me see the slide now. Thanks, Carl. <clears throat> So that uh, that feedback and, and what we also hear from our, in, our employees that have played a big role in developing these plans um, have led to this current document we call the Safety and Security Action Plan. We have over 40 action items that are all in some stage of implementation in the plan. They're uh, broken out in three different areas of work, improving conditions on the system, training and supporting employees, recognizing our own employees are eager to have training and support as they encounter some challenging situations on our system, and also engaging customers and partners, recognizing that Metro Transit has a responsibility to deliver a positive, safe rider experience and experience for employees. And also transit in many ways is a window into some broader society challenges. Uh, and so part of our action plan is to look at ways to partner with others. Uh, and certainly the work you'll hear about uh, with the Transit Service Intervention Project in a moment from Selena is an example of that. Next slide, please delving more into these layers of presence. So one of the foundational pieces of the safety and security action plan goes back to that deep engagement we did uh, years ago where people told us they feel safer on transit when they see a transit official on board. Uh, it doesn't need to be a police officer, but having some type of presence, uh, thank you, uh, leads people to report feeling safer and more comfortable riding transit. So a big area of focus for us over the last year has been developing these different layers of presence. Uh, our Metro Transit police officers really remain an essential piece of that. Uh, but now we have community service officers out on the system inspecting fares. Community service officers are part of our police department, but they're not sworn officers. They're people who are uh, pursuing a career in law enforcement, usually are still students. Uh, so they've become another layer on the system that you might be interacting with if you've been riding with us recently. Uh, the Transit Rider Investment Program, or TRIP agents, Leah Palmer, we'll talk more about them in a moment. Uh, the Supplemental Security Officers, about a year ago, we started uh, placing Supplemental Security at some of our highest ridership locations that also resulted in a high level of customer complaints and employee complaints. So we now have about seven sites with Supplemental Security Officers. They're unarmed. Their job is really to be, again, that presence uh, and able to report in issues and hopefully deter issues as they're out there. And then the Transit Service Intervention Project, sometimes abbreviated TSIP, and Selena will be uh, telling us much more about that, so I won't get ahead of Selena. And I think I have one more slide before handing it over to Leah. Uh, our Metro Transit Police Department. So uh, our police department remains one of those layers of presence. They're the primary law enforcement agency for all transit property and vehicles. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, that includes both full-time sworn police officers, as well as these community service officers that are not sworn police. Our police department also takes the lead in managing our supplemental security contract. Uh, and they continue to hire both uh, police officers and community service officers. We're down about 60 uh, police officers. We're budgeted for 171 and have about 108. So as you, like many law enforcement departments, uh, we do not have as many police officers as we are targeting. Uh, so having these additional layers of presence uh, is also very timely in making sure people are seeing uh, transit officials out on this system and ensuring our police officers can really focus on the serious public safety issues uh, that while other layers of presence can maybe address some of the other um, concerns. 
Uh, and finally, I'll mention to you, even though we're really focused on presence in this presentation, uh, we have other tools and tactics in our toolbox as well. And one key asset for us is our real-time information center. We have cameras uh, on stations, on vehicles that can be monitored in real time. Uh, we have people in the police department who are monitoring those camera feeds uh, when we're in service. And that allows us to more quickly respond to issues when we're alerted of them, uh, allows them to investigate issues when they arise. Uh, and one piece of this, and I'll come back to this when we close at the end, but if you're a writer, you know, you can play a role in helping us uh, address issues that you're encountering. Uh, the picture on the kind of the bottom right there is of a number in a light rail vehicle. And if you text for safety, which is a way to let us know something's happening that maybe doesn't rise to a 911 call, but is something you want addressed or feel uncomfortable about, that's one way you can alert us to that. Um, and again, our police department has the ability to look into uh, that vehicle and see what's happening. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Leah Palmer, who is going to tell us more about the Transit Rider Investment Program. Thanks, Leslie. I appreciate it. Um, so again, my name is Leah Palmer. I am the interim manager of TRIP, um, which has been a very exciting program to lead. Um, TRIP was established by the legislature last year. And so we've spent um, the last you know nine months or so putting together the program, what's it gonna look like and how are we going to implement uh, the legislation and, and um, assist Metro Transit. So um, as Leslie mentioned, um, really TRIP agents are just another level of presence. You know, it's the eyes and ears on the system. Um, the riders, as Leslie mentioned, have indicated that they do want to see uniform presence, and some people aren't comfortable with police officers, so we try to supplement their work by appearing um, in the uniform that you see here. Uh, it's intentionally designed to um, separate ourselves, um, to portray approachability, but also to portray the authority that we need in order to enforce um, fares and to enforce um, our code of conduct. So really what we do is um, uh, be present on our system. Uh, we use professionalism and equity as the core drivers of our work. Um, and our work does include what you see here. It's the fare compliance. So we board, you know, we say Metro Transit, fare enforcement, please have your fares ready. Individuals who don't have fares are asked to either leave the train or they can receive a citation. Um, we enforce that code of conduct. So keeping your feet off the seats you know, one fair, one seat, um, loud music, please turn your music down, things like that, that keep a better environment for our riders. A lot of what we do has to um, relate to customer well-being. So waking individuals who may be sleeping, making sure that they're okay, that they don't need medical assistance, um, helping individuals who maybe need to connect to social services. We work with uh, the folks that Selena will talk about um, and other social service agencies to um, maybe try to help people get to um, some of the, the services that they may need. And really what we try to do is just be that positive, approachable presence. Uh, and so one way I can really illustrate that as we were writing the blue line about a week ago, um, there was a, a woman who kind of motioned me over and she said, you know, I don't want to sound paranoid, but would you mind writing until U.S. Bank? I just don't feel comfortable. And I was like, absolutely. That's what we're there to do. We're there to um, make, um, to the degree possible, a more positive uh, and safe environment for all of our riders. We are deployed right now on the uh, light rail system, so on the blue and the green lines, and we work in teams of three, usually. Um, and uh, our service day works from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. We are looking to expand to the bus rapid transit routes uh, as we continue to increase our staffing. And staffing right now is uh, partly made up by contracted individuals through Allied Universal. Uh, we have um, a contract for up to 24 agents per day to staff the system and perform those duties of a trip agent. And then in the coming months, we'll be adding on um, in-house Metro Transit employees who um, are represented um, through the union here. And with that, I will turn it over to Selena. Thank you, Leah. Good afternoon. Thank you, Carl and MOVE Minneapolis for the opportunity to talk about Transit Service Intervention Project. 
My name is Selina Martina, and in partnership with the uh, Metro Transit Police Department and the HAD team, I coordinate uh, the TSIP, which is different than TRIP. We have a lot of acronyms. So TSIP is a I was enacted in also in 2023 uh, legislative session, so almost a year ago in June, as a one year pilot project asking Metro Transit or Met Council to coordinate high uh, visibility interventions on the light rail, enhance social services outreach and engagement, um, code of conduct regulation, and law enforcement. So, this is really a partnership with our law enforcement. Uh, um, agents here at Metro Transit and the community and community partners in the cities that light rail uh, runs uh, through. Um, Metro Transit received $2 million in appropriations for this project in the 2023 legislative session and more than 1.5 million um, were uh, allocated to 10 community-based contracts uh, to increase uh, organizations that uh, we provide contracts with to increase um, Outreach efforts provide uh, on-site referrals to those um, bullet points you see in the slide. So for those who are experiencing substance use uh, disorders, uh, unhoused, unsheltered homelessness, uh, to also provide on-site screenings for mental health uh, and violence prevention code of conduct regulations. Uh, TSIP, um, uh, about, you probably ask, well, 1.5 was for these contracts and about the remaining of the money is also to reimburse uh, law enforcement agencies that are helping with the high visibility. So the University of Minnesota, we have a joint contract with them as they ride the green line between uh, platforms and stations on, you know, uh, through their campus. Uh, we have a a, a partnership with the Metropolitan Air Com Airport Commissions and MAC police uh, to also ride the blue line and uh, other partnerships with local police uh, agencies. Um, you will see TSIP uh, community based organizations wearing a blue vest and deployed on blue line and green line. You'll see a presence seven days a week. Uh, usually their hours of service is between seven in the morning and 10 p.m. They're not in every single car, not every single train, but certainly you'll see them coming in and out. And really their primary role is to connect with those individuals that are in uh, dire need of uh, resources and services, uh, intervention services. It takes a couple of contacts sometimes to uh, to issue a referral. So since uh, TC was launched last year, really the HAT team, the uh, Homeless Action team, has taken the uh, lead role in creating outreach opportunities with more than 75 events uh, where they partner with county resources, city resources, and connecting individuals to uh, referrals and resources. They did uh, contact more than 3,500 individuals uh, uh, in the first part of TSIP, so the first six months of TSIP, had team uh, conducted um, about 2,300 referrals. So we are really successful in providing referrals to treatment, uh, to health and, and medical you know, benefits, uh, employment, et cetera. The 10 community-based organizations started to provide their service later last year in full force, the beginning of this year. And also result, uh, they are uh, creating a huge impact in connecting with riders, over 1,500 connections and contacts uh, thus far. Um, the majority of the referrals continue to trend around housing and shelter resources. That is, seems to be the highest need in our community through both Green Line and um, Blue Line. And, uh, and again, uh, we are very you know, pleased. We have a lot of information about people who received a referral on the light rails and walked into some of our partners uh, treatment centers off of the green line on university or you know where um, uh, you know um, uh, solicit some uh, resources and refer and treatment from 1800 Chicago on uh, Hennepin County so uh, we are really creating a lot of avenues for folks that are in need of these services to be connected to the right resources in the community. 
So next, I don't think I have another slide, but I yeah, think I you think have. I have one yes. final slide and then we're excited to hear questions or comments. So we've talked about the official presence and the layers we're building on our system, but want to conclude by saying when we talk to people about what leads them to feel safe and comfortable on transit, other riders and having activity, positive activity, people using transit for transit purposes also leads uh, to a more positive experience. And so part of what we're doing in addition to building up these layers of presence on this system is launching a Take Pride in Your Ride campaign, reminding people that a safe and comfortable system starts with all of us who ride. Uh, we are refreshing our signage relating to your role as a rider, which are really the rules for riding. This includes the code of conduct that the Metropolitan Council adopted at the end of 2023, uh, along with uh, things that are legal to do on transit, just again, to remind people what the expectations are when they're riding our system. Uh, also, if you've been out and about on our system, you might see new signage uh, directing you on how to report a problem. And we can't fix things we don't know about yet. And even though we have staff out all the time uh, taking care of facilities or vehicles, uh, it still is helpful when people let us know when they're encountering something that needs to be addressed. So uh, if you see something that's dirty or broken, uh, we ask you to report that to our customer relations department. That's where the QR code on the report a problem or report problems uh, signage goes. If you're uh, feeling uh, unsafe or seeing something suspicious, potentially threatening, that text for safety number that I talked about earlier uh, is a good option there. And of course, if there's ever an emergency, um, calling 911 is also a way that will get us to respond to what's happening immediately. So uh, with that, again, thank you so much for having us here today. And we look forward to answering any questions or addressing any comments. Uh, that being said, I'm going to jump us into our uh, conversation point. Reminder, please use the Q&A function. Uh, you can submit those uh, via text, and we'll answer them live here today. We will be following up if there is no, if there are questions that we don't have time for today. We will be following up with those directly after the session as well. Our first question: um, Are TSIP and or trip conducting services in areas around stations as well? And following up on that, kind of any further information on what the geographic bounds of uh, that presence around or on platforms might be. I can speak about TSIP. Uh, so that's a great question, thank you. So since TSIP is a lot about partnering with uh, county resources, even state resources, uh, we do have, uh, we provide our intervention services on platforms, but mostly on the trains. However, our HAD team has really strong connections with the city, for example, city of St. Paul, they have a coast team. So they have uh, social workers that go out on our Union Depot uh, station and they board the trains and they provide intervention services in partnership with St. Paul Library. So we really connect a lot of uh, the intervention uh, the contacts and referrals to local and nearby resources when we know they are available. But the primary jurisdiction, if we will, of TSIP is on platforms and on trains. That's a great question. And I can add to that regarding TRIP. Um, our also primary jurisdiction is on the light rail and the platform. So you'll see us out there on those places. However, um, the surrounding areas, we do partner obviously very closely with the Metro Transit Police Department. We have direct contact with them through a radio system that contacts our dispatch. So if there are issues, you know, at a nearby transit property or something else, um, in the area, then we can get in touch with the right partners to get those addressed. Well, thank you both. Uh, following up on that, um, there's uh, a question I'm going to summarize specifically around uh, some of the rules of what's changed around fair enforcement. So some, there was a question around uh, seeing police officers not following up with that fair enforcement. Curious if you can follow up uh, and answer the question, uh, kind of differentiate which of these roles are specifically responsible for monitoring fares and then how those are um, 
what the follow up on that fair enforcement is as well. And maybe Leah, may I just provide a little background and then hand it over to you to talk more specifically about some of the, the pieces of that question. Uh, first, one of the changes in the transportation bill last year was to make transit uh, fair non-compliance an administrative offense as opposed to a criminal one. So before the law changed, uh, fair non-compliance was a misdemeanor. And as a result, before the uh, law change, we only had sworn police officers inspecting fares and writing those citations. The citations were criminal citations would go to the court system. Uh, and for years, tracing back to 2019, the Metropolitan Council was advocating to change that to an administrative citation. So part of the Transit Rider Investment Program did provide us with that authority. Uh, and starting in December of 2023, the community service officers who are non-sworn uh, members of the police department began the process of inspecting fares and writing administrative citations. And uh, the transit rider investment program personnel, the trip agents uh, are now also being trained to do that work too. But there are a lot of specific questions in there. I just wanted to provide that backdrop because it's, it's something that we've looked uh, to change for years as an agency. And uh, so we are very much in that transition of shifting to non-sworn personnel doing fair inspection writing citations, but we uh, help fill in the details there. No, that's all uh, summarizes it very nicely. So when officers board the train, um, a lot of times it's to make sure that individuals are safe, to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, to address any, you know, code of conduct or other criminal issues that may be going on. So you'll definitely see them on the trains and on the platforms. Um, TRIP and the CSOs really supplement that by checking the fares, using our fare validators, um, inspecting the tickets and things like that. Um, so we can um, remove some of that responsibility for fare enforcement from the police department, from police officers, so they can address those more serious issues and we can handle the fare enforcement. So while you see them, um, the, the trip agents and the CSOs are the ones who are truly engaged in that fair enforcement as well as other duties. Um, thank you all so much. Following up, um, we've got some excitement around the fact that y'all are chatting about uh, addressing perceptions of safety and perceptions of presence as well. Uh, following up with the question of if that is something that is being quantified or measured in any way, and also uh, how y'all are evaluating perceptions differently from folks who ride at different times of day or might come from different um, demographic backgrounds as well. Maybe I can start with that one. So it's it's a great question. And I think our primary way of looking at uh, perception right now is through customer uh, feedback, including uh, surveys that we do. So we collect information from people who are riding in a variety of ways, including asking questions about whether they feel safe while riding, whether they feel safe while waiting for transit. So I would say that's usually the data that comes closest to perception. And uh, it's correct that you see differences in terms of who's riding where, their own background, you know, different people bring themselves and their experiences when they're riding our system. And so um, what leads one person to feel unsafe uh, might have a different impact on another person. And, and I'll just admit, I think that is really difficult to measure, but certainly listening to our customers uh, using survey data, that's giving us some sense of that. If, if that answers the question, but happy to dig into that more if I'm not really hitting the mark there. And certainly would welcome Selena, Leah, too, if I'm not thinking of something, but. Yeah. Selena, Selena, it looks like you're. Yes, you're I'm yet. sorry. Yes, I was muted. Sorry. Yes, Leslie. Uh, I think that, yeah, we have uh, started. I don't know if you want to add more, Leslie, on our grade A in transit and being out there and connecting directly with riders. 
to understand more their experiences. We collected a lot of data through our customer relations department about, you know, what are the experiences of our riders. We uh, report those uh, to the legislature as part of TSIP in terms of, you know, what we are seeing. So, uh, but it is, you know, um, as Leslie pointed out, very, very hard to measure from one perspective and it's really understanding that we offer a service that in that uh, for the entire community and, and people have different needs, different ones and different reasons why they use our service as well. So following up on that question, um, I want to make sure I highlight that that uh, um, individual is also asking about um, perceptions being measured for individuals who don't already ride. I know that a lot of those similar surveys go out to those same people. Curious if you can elaborate further on some of that for both um, people who are out riding the system as well as people who are transit curious. Yeah, that's a great question. And in general, I personally want us to be doing more measuring perceptions, not only on safety, but of people who are lapsed riders, perhaps were riding with us at one point and are not riding or riding regularly with us now, and uh, people who aren't riders to get a sense of maybe what are some of the barriers we can be addressing to uh, turn them into transit riders. Uh, I will say uh, we do an annual survey that asks some questions of non-riders and it allows us to see, yeah, is there a difference between how riders report feeling in terms of safety to non-riders? And we do see some sort of gap, but I'll just say, I don't think we have really rich data to understand that. Uh, and so it's, it's an area we need to grow more information on. Thank you for, for following up on that. I'm, I'm sure we're excited to learn more. Um, I'm going to summarize a, a couple of questions that we've got around specifically on light rail and the different experience of riding in different cars of the train. I know Metro Transit has uh, some ex uh, has explored and is uh, continuing to make some changes to two versus three cars, as well as where individuals might have different experiences. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. So. I will say as someone who rides light rail pretty regularly, if you are out talking to customers or even my own experiences, the middle car often becomes uh, what people will call the party car. We're aware of that. It's something that I'm sure our trip agents are seeing, our TISA partners are seeing too. Um, and so that's uh, a phenomenon that we take into account as we're deploying presence on the system. Now. The question about two car trains uh, is delinked from that knowledge in that we are uh, preparing to start using two car trains more frequently in the coming months. Uh, and that's not uh, driven by safety concerns. That's driven by looking at the ridership data and recognizing that when we run three car trains, when we don't have the high ridership that would be that we would need three car trains to accommodate, we end up um, accumulating more wear and tear on our equipment, uh, which creates uh, additional maintenance needs that are not necessary to move the volume of riders we have now. Uh, and so that's why we're looking at uh, going to two car trains uh, when there aren't uh, big events out. Uh, and so forth. And it's something that uh, we are going to be really interested in gathering feedback on, see how that affects the experience of people. Uh, but the reason we're preparing to do that is uh, to really right size the equipment we have out there to the ridership. And also it'll help us build uh, up to increasing fr frequency on light rail. So right now uh, we're mostly running 15 minute service. We're hoping uh, by the end of the summer to be able to bring that up to 12 minute service if our hiring uh, stays on track. So we're not at a point we can say we're, we'll be there for sure, but that's uh, the direction where we're heading in. And if I can just chime in for a second, I will say uh, with regard to the trip agents and, and how we conduct our work, you know, like Leslie said, we know that sometimes the middle car is the most problematic car. So as we move, um, you know, through the each of the cars on the train, first car, check the fares, 
address any issues. Second car, that might be where we spend a little bit more time, even after we've checked all the fares. Sometimes it's just being present. We know that right away when we get on, there are people who now view our presence as a strong presence, and uh, they go ahead and, and step right off the train um, because they don't want us, they don't want to interact with us, you know, because they don't want to be told these are the rules, you have to have a fare, et cetera. So um, in that way, it's just really positive to have more uniformed people out there and able to impact the ridership that way. So I feel, um, I'm, I'm feeling like you're going to see some of those issues decrease as we continue to grow the trip program and get more and more staff out there and be able to work in different ways uh, with different partners to, to have as many people as possible out there. Awesome. So I can, yes, thank you, Carl. I can add from the TC perspective and the partnership with the Metro Transit Police Department, the chief has made uh, changes to, you know, deployment of his leadership staff and more presence on, on the green line and really working with uh, simple police department and other, and other um, agencies such as uh, Ramsey County to uh, provide more presence, more police presence and more interventions on the green line. So we are really working jointly with community partners to address, you know, the the use of illegal drugs and other, you know, conducts and misbehavior that is happening on the green line, especially in that middle car. So I see a couple of questions referring to that. So certainly, you know, and I know the question said about undercover policing. So there is uh, a lot of um, work undergoing in the planning of joint efforts between simple, uh, simple police department and Metro Transit Police Department. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for all for following up on that. Um, I wanted to uh, get into a couple of questions around the community-based organizations that you all are working with, what the official recruitment process for those are, whether there is a competitive bidding process for that, um, as well as if there are any further um, uh, services around uh, housing and shelter that uh, it y'all are looking to fill gaps with in recruiting further organizations in that process as well. Leslie, you want me to start? Like, yeah. Okay, so yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, that's uh, for TSIF, so our Transit Service Intervention Project, like I said, it was enacted after the 2023 uh, legislative session. Uh, so we had about a day or maybe <laughs> To, to really, uh, you know, uh, launch TSIP uh, early last summer. Uh, so as we were doing uh, outreach and partnership intervention uh, um, events and activities on the blue line and green line, we work with Met Council procurement on uh, having inf information sessions and opportunities for community-based organizations to learn about our procurement practices and also opportunities to submit a proposal for these intervention services. So we um, launched, we had a, a declaration of interest such as, an, you know, similar to an RFP process where we hosted two information sessions. We distributed through, you know, different channels and networks of community-based uh, organizations that provide these type of services that were very prescriptive in the, in the law and received um, almost 40 uh, uh, proposals that were uh, carefully considered through, you know, equity lenses and our procurement process uh, 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 evaluation criteria, and 10 of them were selected to provide uh, the, the services. So uh, it, is, uh, it was a public process where we, you know, uh, went to uh, transportation committee and the Met Council to approve the contract of these uh, selected vendors. And, uh, and yeah, and that we really, uh, we're pleased with we, with uh, the selection of our community-based organizations. It's a lot of work to have 10 vendors out there and coordinate their efforts and schedules. And they provide a very different, uh, different type of services that are very needed in, um, you know, in our green line and blue line. So yeah, thank you for that question. Um, following up on that, uh, adjacently, it looks like there have been uh, 
there's some questions regarding specific um, community-based organizations, not specifically for uh, TSIP, but around TRIP working with Allied. I know we spoke briefly to some of that in the past. Curious if you can elaborate um, uh, on some of the process for uh, Allied's uh, relationship of going forward, as well as some of their uh, relationship with their with uh, security around the light rail stations. If there is an opportunity for uh, transit riders or transit curious individuals to provide feedback on their relationship with those individuals as well, and maybe I'll start this. And certainly, Leah, if you want to speak more about it too. But so we have a contract with Allied Universal that was the result of a competitive process. I believe the council. Um, authorized execution of that contract following an RFP request for proposal process back um, in March of 2023. And then we started having allied personnel probably by by June, if maybe a little bit into May of 2023. So they uh, received the contract through a, a formal procurement process to do supplemental security. Uh, and then in December, the council voted to add to that contract uh, additional funds to also and grow the scope to also include transit rider investment program agents. And so our first batch of trip agents are also allied staff in addition to the supplemental security officers we have at seven locations. Uh, and so um, that is that will need to go through a procurement process again. Um, so we will be starting that process later this year, the contracts up in um, next year, uh, but certainly people have comments, feedback about their experiences. I know, I, I think we put in the chat a way you can email comments to us, but we'd be very interested in, in feedback on, on how that's going and what people want us to know about that service. So. Yeah, I think just to add on to that, um, one of the questions about, um, you know, the different kind of roles of, of allied agents. Um, the trip agents are, are a separate team from the security guards that you see at the platform. So the security guards at the platforms have a different role and different abilities that they're authorized to handle. Uh, and the trip agents have a, a totally different uh, set of duties that they perform that align with um, the standards actually within the statute, as well as our, you know, operating procedures here at Metro Transit. So it's a little bit different, um, although both are contracted from Allied under the same procurement process that Leslie mentioned. Um, we touched on this just briefly at the end of the um, last, at the end of the presentation of how um, transit riders can report any uh, maintenance issues or cleanliness issues at stations. We've been speaking today about how some of the thought process around staffing and procedures for presence on board have changed. Curious if you can elaborate to, uh, adjacently about how uh, cleanliness fits into that particularly perception and if there are any changes to how maintenance staffing and procedures might be changing or changed in the past. Yeah, great question. And another element of the transportation bill passed by the state legislature last year, signed by the governor, included a requirement that Metro Transit establish cleaning and repair standards for our facilities as well as our vehicles. And so we uh, submitted our initial report on establishing those standards back in October and are really looking at how we can improve our business processes uh, to ensure that we are doing a better job keeping our facilities and our vehicles in great shape. Um, and so some of that includes uh, funding additional positions to have more staff available to do that work. And we're looking for other opportunities to use data to really help inform our processes around that as well. Uh, that report problem sticker that was on the final slide we had is one piece of that legislative requirement that we make it clear to people how they can report issues with facilities or vehicles. Uh, and so again, that's that's helpful for us. We do have staff out there looking at that. We inspect things regularly, um, but having riders uh, alert us to issues is one more way that we can ensure 
we're taking care of them. I'll also mention uh, we have an adopt a stop program through our customer relations department. If you're interested, I personally have adopted two uh, Beeline shelters. Beeline's not running quite yet, but uh, Route 21 is. Uh, and it's a good opportunity for individuals or groups to um, you know, be a part of helping keep uh, transit infrastructure in a, you know, in a good state for everyone in the community too. So if that's of interest to you, um, it's, a, it's a fun program and uh, we always enjoy having more people volunteer with us. Awesome. Um, following up on that question, um, specifically, we've had a number of questions in the chat around um, smoking use and uh, kind of cleanliness of uh, some uh, drug use on, on stations and adjacently as well. As well. Um, there's uh, both a question around uh, possibility of having no smoking signs, as well as uh, actions that are being taken to address that smoking specifically. Sure, I'll start and then we want Leah to talk about how trip agents play a role in this too. Uh, we do have some non-smoking signage. Certainly it's part of that your role as a rider sign, but the fact that the question's being asked is leading me to think we need to take a look at how prominent that signage is. So thank you for asking that question uh, because it is illegal to smoke on transit. And uh, it's one of the top concerns I hear uh, it's something I see happening, um, happening at all is too frequently uh, because it's really affecting uh, the health and experience of other riders and our employees. So uh, I mentioned uh, towards the end of the presentation that we're kicking off a Take Pride in Your Ride campaign. And the first area of focus for that is an anti-smoking message. Uh, and so uh, during, and Selena also mentioned a program we have internally called Great Day in Transit, where we have employees sign up for shifts to be added presence on the system. We probably should have had a slide in there just to let you know, transit employees are taking a lot of ownership on this too. Uh, but we were out there reminding people you can't smoke on transit, handing out resources to people who might be interested in uh, quitting uh, and just, again acknowledging that it, it's not acceptable to have smoking on transit and we're continuously looking for ways to get that message across so um but again if we want to say anything about how trip agents are handling that or even our transit service intervention project partners i know interrupt that behavior too so um yeah we are selena help me fill in what i missed i think that's exactly the right term is to interrupt that behavior again going back to just you know the the trip agents being just a presence um, you know, people see us and then they think twice about the things that they want to do that uh, aren't in line with our code of conduct or that are flat out illegal. So there are occasions where we have to remind people, you know, especially vaping. I will say that, that that seems to be people, people don't even think of it as smoking, which of course it is. Um, and then, you know, but people think when they get off the train, then they can smoke on the platform, which is also a no smoking zone. So we do a lot of reminding people on the platforms too. You can't smoke here either. So um, you know, we're working again as staffing grows, you'll see more and more, more and more of us out there and continuing to spread that message and address that issue. Awesome. Uh, thank you all. Uh, delving into some questions specifically around um, certain stations. And I know we've uh, talked about some of these resources of where they're available on our uh, blue line and green line and uh, around some specific stations. Uh, it was touched on earlier, but curious if you can follow up on what's being done on the North Star and what can be looked forward in that direction as well. Sure, so North Star, I think the we are able to provide more service uh, in recent months than we had been earlier uh, or in previous years, I should say, uh, back in October, we increased weekday service on North Star. Uh, and uh, as we're heading into the summer, uh, we're planning on serving 
um, twins, mini twins games, uh, Vikings games, other special events. So um, I would say kind of the big news around North Star is having additional service uh, compared to what we've had the previous few years. Uh, and then uh, North Star, like all of our transit, is an area that we want to make sure we're keeping a positive, safe environment. Uh, and so uh, our police department, you know, has their patrols. At this point, I should say the Transit Service Intervention Project um, by law is specific to light rail, so you won't see TSIP on there. Uh, I think for TRIP, the focus has been light rail, and, but it'll move to our proof of payment systems too. Uh, but certainly if people are experiencing issues on North Star, the same advice uh, remains, you know, text for safety, use that report a problem um, information, let us know what, what you're experiencing uh, and we'll make sure we're addressing it. Thank you all. Um, wanted to um, delve into a question that's outside of this specific topic, but around kind of our conversations around ridership. Uh, there was a question around some of the uh, fare options uh, like Metro Pass. Uh, the Metro Pass is a, a resource that employers can offer to employees that is an unlimited pass and they, employers also have the option to subsidize some of that use as well. I'll, I'll put in a selfish, selfish pitch that Move Minneapolis is happy to help anyone uh, work with their employer or in the, with their employees to help make that happen. Uh, there was a question around if there are options to reevaluate some of those fair options as we are uh, in living in more of a hybrid world or if there are options for uh, employers to take on uh, encouragement for their employees around transit outside of full-time passes? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that we are taking a look at because it's a comment we are getting uh, from people whose, um, yeah, whose work schedules have changed. It might be different than they were before the pandemic. So uh, we do have a pretty new position in our marketing department that's looking at our past options. And uh, so it's a timely question in that if there are ideas people have or feedback, certainly would welcome that because uh, we want to make sure we're offering products that meet people's needs. Um, not specific to that question, but because we have been talking about fair non-compliance, I'll also mention that we do have a transit assistance program, TAP, uh, which allows people who are income qualified to ride for a dollar a ride. Uh, and part of uh, having trip agents, having the transit service intervention uh, project partners out on the system, uh, they've been additional ways to help us educate people about that option too. So just wanted to mention that in the broader context of fares. We just got a couple minutes left here, so I'm gonna, um, uh, follow up with one final question for us. Uh, there's a question around what type of social support training are being offered to the different types of uh, uh, staffers or security agents that are available. Specifically, this question was thinking about trauma-informed care, harm reduction, or de-escalation efforts. So I'm glad you asked that question, actually. Um, we spent a lot of time designing the training for the trip agents. And it uh, is, it's a partnership with Allied. They provide the CPR training. They provide de-escalation training, which is an eight-hour training, and they just had a six-hour refresher on it. Um, and then we provide, you know, other training regarding fare enforcement. Um, we provide Narcan training. The agents do carry Narcan out there. Um, in the event they uh, find someone who needs it. And then we have been uh, working with Selena's team and with the Homeless Action team. Um, they provide training to the TRIP agents um, regarding all the social services that are available, what's out there, um, anything from um, culturally appropriate healthcare to um, you know some of the unsheltered services that are out there. Uh, it's a really robust training that Selena and Sergeant Rodriguez provided to the team. And uh, actually, just this morning, we had a conversation about how to continue training because it's not just a one and done, like, hey, get on the street. We did this. Um, so we're talking about having kind of lunch and learns with the agents pulling in the morning ones, bringing the afternoon ones in early, 
and doing, you know, different sort of either refreshers or new information and things like that. And one of the things that came up was actually social services and how we can expand what we're doing, our knowledge base, those types of things. Awesome. On on that note, I see we're at time here. We still have some unanswered questions in uh, the chat. We'll be sure to follow up with those in uh, the follow-up email that will have the recording of this today, as well as um, the slide deck to make sure that you see those slides that might have been missed in the live portion and some follow-up on those unanswered questions. I want to thank you all for being here today and especially thank our um, guests who are here from Metro Transit, we really appreciate these opportunities to be able to uh, engage directly and have conversations with all of you are here today as you are continuing to move forward with presence on board yourselves.